All right, just keep your Bibles open there in uh, Psalm 62. We are going to come back to this chapter, so just keep it open there. Uh, but uh, it's going to be a bit of an interesting sermon this morning. Uh, you know, at the end of last year, before we went into 2020, I preached a sermon. You may recall the title of it. It was called 2020 Vision. Not very original. A lot, I've seen a lot of sermons online called 2020 Vision you know, as we got into the, the year 2020. Uh, but that sermon was all about setting a vision, you know, s- you know, setting a vision, then setting some, some milestones and some goals that you can uh, reach in order to accomplish that vision. And as I was going through and giving you some, some advice, you know, for a New Year's resolution, the one thing that I was always trying to uh, say within that sermon, you can go back and listen to it, is that you can really apply that at any point in your life. Any point that you need to uh, set yourself a vision, you want to set something up and, and, and do what you can with the help of God to accomplish that vision. Now, there is a, a portion of that sermon that Brother Matt's going to play on the big screen. That's why it's up there at the moment. And it's only about four or five minutes long. So we're going to play that first. I want you guys to hear that, okay? Uh, just to bring to your remembrance some of the things that I preached about back then. And then we're going to build that sermon off what I preached back at the end of uh, last year. All right. So, Brother Matt, when you're ready, I'll get you to play that. Thank you. Mark chapter 8, verse 22. And he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind man unto him, and besought him to touch him. Of course, a blind man coming to Jesus for healing. Verse number 23. And he took the blind man by the hand, and led him out of the town. And when he had spit on on his eyes, and put his hands upon him, he asked him if he saw aught. And he looked up and said, I see men as trees walking. After that, he put his hands again upon his eyes and made him look up, and he was restored and saw every man clearly. I said that your vision must be clear. What's the story that we get here? A blind man goes to Jesus, blind, right, needing help. Jesus, uh, what's he do? Spits um, on his hands, puts his hands upon him, and what, his vision becomes clearer, right? He starts to see, but he can't see 100% clearly. He doesn't have 20-20 vision at this point, right? What he can see is men as trees walking. He can see some shadows. He can see some lights. He can see the people, not just hear the people. He can see the people, but he can't make them out. They just look like trees to him. So what does Jesus have to do again? He puts his hands upon his eyes once again, and then he's fully restored. And then it says there, and he can see, he saw every man clearly. What's the third, third point about your vision? Number three is reassess your vision from time to time. Reassess your vision from time to time. You know, you may have had a vision in 2019, okay? And you may not have accomplished the things you wanted to do. You know, and and you look back now and it's it's become blurry. You know, you see men as trees walking. Well, this is what's wonderful about the end of the year is a lot of people stop and say, well, what can I do for the next year? You know, they reassess their vision. They they reestablish the clarity. They bring the clarity back. What is it that I need to do? And this is a healthy thing to do. Create a vision, but understand as as time goes on, as as life changes, as things around you change, that vision might become cloudy. cloudy. And that's when you need to reassess your vision. You need to go to Christ one more time and, and clear up that vision, establish it all over again. This is a great time, brethren. It's a great time at the end of the year. Now, look, you can do this at any point in your life. You know, every day is a new day, all right? Every, I, I could preach this sermon any time, right? Every day, if you need to reassess your vision, stop and reassess. You know, I, I've shared this with the men, I, I believe, or maybe the church. You know, there was a time when I was, I, was, I was working a job. I was there for nine years, and I know why I was there. I had a vision. I had to provide for my family. You know, we bought a house. You know, we had a lot of things going on. You know, it, it was local. It was somewhere where I could go to church and, and all these kinds of things. But after nine years and after whatever number of kids we had, I can't remember now, six or seven kids, you know, life had changed, right? From just being a single man, I'm not a single man, but a married man with no kids, life changes and I had to stop. I had to reassess, you know, and I took time off work because I was was a little bit, my my vision was cloudy. You know, do I continue just doing what I've been doing for the last nine years? Life has changed. We've got a whole bunch of kids now, right? So what did I do? I stopped working because I could, you know, I had saved up, had a bit of a buffer there. Stop working and just with Christina, what is it that we need to do now? What is the next, what is the next challenge over the next decade? Like, what is it that we need to do? 
You know, what is it that we need to change? I had to reassess the vision because men look like trees walking to me. I wasn't sure what I was going to do with the rest of my life. And, you know, brethren, if you're at a point where maybe in the past things were clear to you and now you're like, I'm not sure where to go, reassess your vision. Nothing wrong with that. Reassess it. Praise God that He's gotten gotten you where you are today. Hey, maybe you've reached your vision. Maybe you've accomplished what you wanted to accomplish. Great. Create a new vision now, right? Create a new vision for the coming years because life changes, okay? Life changes, and you, you all know that. And I, I, that's why I love this teaching here. I love this, this, this story about Christ having to heal this blind man, man twice because that teaches us many things, you know? Many things. It's like doctrine. You know, you might learn doctrine, but it's not just fully clear to you. You believe it, but it's not clear. You go back, you establish, you, you read the Bible again, you learn, you, you nail down those doctrines, now you can see clearly. Many practical ways we can take this story that Jesus has and apply it to our lives, but I want to apply it to the, your vision. Reassess your vision. All right, so um, <clears throat> that's from my sermon, 2020 Vision. The title for the sermon this morning is 2020 Revision. Okay, 2020 Revision. You say, why do we need to revise? What's going on? Well, I don't know, there's a pandemic, right? There's been a lot of changes. You know, when I looked at 2020, I was really excited for this coming, well, this year, so we're already halfway through it now, right? I was excited for this year to come. I had established some things that I wanted to accomplish uh, personally and, and as a church, and let me just share what some of those things were. You know, we were coming up with that Soul Winning Mega Marathon was, was coming up, weren't we? You know, that was being part of a, a global event. And, you know, I was asked to, to look after the events for, or, or to oversee, I suppose, the events for Australia and New Zealand. We are going to send Brother Tim to Melbourne. We we're going to send Brother Ramsey down in Sydney to uh, Wellington, uh, you know, to, to start some of those, uh, uh, get the Soul Winning going on there for that. You know, that's, that's part of vision. That's, that's part of a, a big plan, is it not, for our church and, and for what we were able to accomplish back then. Hey, we're talking about a documentary, weren't we, men? We're talking about setting up a documentary. I was going to go and, and uh, visit some old-time uh, preachers, some old-time pastors, missionaries, and interview them for a documentary. We're hoping to get one done this year, maybe two. You know, uh, is that going? That's not going ahead this year. <laughs> that's not that's not happening uh, this year. You know, the other thing, and not all of you guys know this, but uh, you know, with Brother Sam, we're planning on on having Friday night church services down in Brisbane. You know, New Life Baptist Church down in Brisbane, not another church, just church services down there uh, for the brethren that live further down south, for the brethren that, or other people that we might be able to uh, find in that local area and try to have Friday night services uh, just for them. You know, that was meant to be happening from May. That was going to be a weekly event from fr- on Fridays. Hey, that, that's, that hasn't happened. I don't see that happening at this point in time. The other thing we had planned was for our free year anniversary. We're going to go down to Coffs Harbour. I was trying to get that organized. We're going to have a combined uh, meeting or church gathering with uh, not just this church, but Blessed Hope Baptist Church down in Sydney. You know, that was going to be, uh, you know, something that I wanted to, to invest a lot of time and uh, thought into it, you know, uh, to bring the two churches together for fellowship and soul winning in Coffs Harbour. Look, I, I can't plan that. I would have been planning that already, you know, if it wasn't for this uh, pandemic and all the lockdowns and the restrictions, all that. And finally, at the end of the year, in November, I had planned to do a missions trip to Chile, you know. I was going to take one other uh, brother down in Sydney with me and uh, some members of Faith Word Baptist Church, Pastor Stephen Anderson, was going to be part of that as well. It could still happen. I guess it's possible, but it's, it's very unlikely, <laughs> especially with the cases, the chronic cases that are going on in Chile at the moment, South America. It's kind of out of control there at the moment. So I can't really see that happening. And so I had set this vision for 2020, right? I had set some plans, some goals, and brethren, when we started to, when everything started to lock down and our state was closed and, and we couldn't fly international, and a lot of my flights down to Sydney for the church there were being cancelled left, right, and centre, you know, I don't know about you, but I started to get frustrated. I started to get annoyed. Why is this happening, God? You know, I was excited for 2020. I had set a good vision, I believed, and I believe it was a good vision. I believe a lot of these things are there to, for the glory of God, for the glory of God, Right? And, you know, maybe some of you had personal plans, maybe not just things relating to church, but maybe in your personal life, you had plans for 2020. And with all these things, you know, you probably got frustrated. I think you probably did, because I got frustrated. And we're made of the same flesh and blood. I personally got very frustrated about many of these things, uh, very upset, and very upset when we couldn't meet for church as well, you know, where we couldn't be in the house of God, and that was uh, prohibited for some time there. And, uh, you know, one... 
it, it's easy to get upset, I suppose. You guys are in Psalm 62. I hope you kept your Bible there. Psalm 62, it's easy to become frustrated when you're forced to wait. It's easy to get frustrated when you're forced to stop. And, and the plans you had to do, the plans you wanted to achieve, you just can't do it. You know, you've been put at a standstill, right? And the vision can't be reached that you had originally planned. But as I had shown you in that previous uh, sermon from end of last year, from time to time, you have to have a revision. And now that I think about it, now that hindsight is 2020, I can think back and say, well, hey, this is a good example. This is a good time for, re- for us to reassess, for us to establish a new vision, just as I had preached. We can put this into practice, is what I'm trying to say, right? And look at Psalm 62, verse 5. You can either get frustrated, you can either get upset when you have to stop, or in some, verse number 5, it says, My soul, wait thou only upon God. You can either get frustrated, brethren, that you can't reach the plans you were trying to reach, do the things you were trying to do, or you can decide, Lord, I'm just going to wait upon you. Amen. I'm going to wait upon God. Listen, if anything, this tested our patience. Okay, if anything, I'm sure we've all grown in patience to some extent. So, right? we've, we've allowed the Lord God to work in us and say, Lord, please help me to calm down. Help me to, to relax a little bit, Lord. Help me to understand this is all part of the bigger picture. We know this world is getting more wicked. We know that this world will use things like this coronavirus to further their wicked agenda for a one world government, for a cashless society, all these things that we read about in the Bible. We understand that, Lord. But instead of getting fidgety about it, we should be like the psalmist here, where we say we're going to wait upon God. And you know what? I've, just, I've been able to rest in that now. I've been able to rest and say, Lord, maybe you've just put everything, you stopped everything. And actually, when I talk to a lot of you, it's like a lot of your prayers have been answered. <laughs> you know, during this whole coronavirus, it's like God just stepped in and answered everyone's prayers at once for different things, for different reasons, you know. Some of you got more time to spend with your family, spend time with your kids. Praise God for that opportunity. Some of you don't have to travel to work that much, right? You can stay home and, and you know, save on the cost of travel, save on that time and invest that time in more productive things, right? I mean, hey, maybe some of these things I had planned for 2020, maybe they would have burnt me out. I don't know. Maybe God put a stop to some of these things because it would have been too much potentially. Look, I, I don't know. But here's the thing. One thing that I know for sure is that God wants us to wait upon Him. Keep going, verse number five. It says, for my expectation is from Him. My expectation is from Him. Hey, my expectation is not on the local government. It's not on the media. It's not on these other authorities and other, uh, other sources of information. Our expectation should be upon God. We should be waiting for God to move and then for us to respond to that move that God has made. Look at verse number six. It says, He only is my rock and my salvation. He is my defense. I shall not be moved. Listen, if we're resting on God, we're not going to be moved. We're not going to be wavering to and fro when we're waiting upon God. Hey, but if we're waiting on the results of this virus, if we're waiting on how the government wants us to respond, or, or you know, we're going to be unsettled. We're going to be tossed to and fro. If we're waiting on some professional to tell me what to do in light of this pandemic, you're going to be tossed to, to and fro. But when our expectation, when we're waiting upon God, hey, we can be established. We can be unmovable because our God is our strong defense. All right? And, you know, when we look at this situation, the pandemic, yeah, we've been forced to stop. And maybe that's a good thing. Maybe it's been a time for us to reflect on establishing a new vision, a revision. Again, the title for the sermon this morning is 2020 Revision. And I know this verse is cliche, but it's so true. You know, Romans 8, 28, it says, For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them that who are called according to to his purpose. Do you believe that, brethren? That if you love God, that all things will work together for good. Hey, that means the coronavirus is being worked together for your good. For your good. You're getting frustrated. Oh, why is this happening? It's for your good if you love God. Now, if you don't love God, well, don't expect it to be good for you. All right? And if we love God, the Bible Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commandments. How do we show our love toward God? We keep the commandments that God has given us. And brethren, if you're just loving God, you're just wanting to serve God, you know, no matter how challenging things can get, no matter how cloudy your vision might get, no matter, you know, how badly you're trying to achieve those goals and you can't do it, just just be content, you know, and know that those things are going to work together for your good, for your good. 
And so, you know, yes, I was frustrated at the beginning. I was frustrated that I couldn't achieve the plans that I wanted to achieve. But now I just rest in the fact that, well, this is for my good. There must be a reason be behind this. I may not fully understand it on this side of eternity, but surely when I get to heaven and I can speak to God one-on-one, -on -one, I'm sure He's going to reveal uh, some amazing truths to us that we can't fully appreciate right now. Please go to Acts chapter 1, please. Go to Acts chapter... Actually, no. Yeah, go to Acts chapter 1. Go to Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 6. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 6. What is the revision that you're speaking of? Pastor Kevin, well, you know, obviously I've spoken to uh, every family here, uh, I believe. Yeah, I have definitely spoken to every, every family here, or at least some representatives of each family. And a lot of you guys know what I'm planning on doing uh, toward the end of this year, all right? So uh, come October, we're going to be celebrating our three-year anniversary. You know, I, I want to be here. I, I want to be able to celebrate with that with you guys. We're going to make that a, a great event. We're going to celebrate what God has been able to do with New Life Baptist Church in three years. But then straight after that, brethren, uh, I'll be heading down uh, with the family down to Sydney uh, to be a help to Blessed Hope Baptist Church, to be a full-time pastor for 12 months to Blessed Hope Baptist Church, okay? And you know, you know the plans. I'm, I'm not moving for any personal financial reasons. You know, no matter what, you know, thought might go through your head, why they move in, there's one reason why, and that's to help that church, all right? And I am the pastor of this. I would do anything for this church. All right, I'll do anything except my fa sacrifice my family. Right, my family comes first. But besides that, you know, I want to serve this church. But I also have another church that I've been given authority over. You know, when we started that church, Blessed Hope Baptist Church, some two years ago, I wasn't. I, you know, I, it's not like we started and I was thinking, you know what? At the end of three years here, I'm going to go down to Sydney and help them out. You know, I had no idea what might develop. I'm not sure what, what, what it would look like. I wasn't sure if there'd be a man ready to step up. I wasn't sure if that church could just join another church, right? That would be maybe like-minded or a good church they can be part of. I wasn't sure what could happen, all right? And this is why you need to, you know, look at your vision and reassess it from time to time because things change. And brethren, when I look at this church, I see a mature church. Now, I don't know if you, if you believe that. I believe that, okay? I see a mature church, okay? You say, how do you know that? Well, I'm, I compare this church to other churches I've been in, okay? Other good churches that I've been in, and I'm telling you, I see more maturity in a lot of you, in your families, in your love for God, in your knowledge for doctrine than many other churches. I'm talking about independent fundamental Baptist churches that I've seen. I see a maturity. I've seen growth in all of you, in your love for God, in your, in your desire to serve the local church. I believe this church is ready to allow me to, you know, to, to offer a sacrifice, I suppose, to the Lord so I can go and help bless it up at this church. But in saying that, you know, you guys are important to me. And so I'm going to be traveling up here every Wednesday for midweek services, except one Wednesday, which is my twins, the twins birthday. I'll be arranging something else there. Okay. But every other Wednesday, I'll be here and there'll be some Sundays as well that I'll be here. Okay, to give the preachers a, a bit of a break on Sundays. There will be some odd Sundays. I'm trying to work out the details still, but there'll be some Sundays that I do make my way up here uh, to be a blessing back to you guys. And at the end of the 12 months, we'll be traveling back up here with the family to continue the work here, all right, to establish a new vision for New Life Baptist Church. That's the revision that I'm speaking about. Now, that wasn't my plan. You know, I didn't go into 2020 expecting that. You know, I told you what I was planning on doing, all right? There was a lot. There was enough, enough to do in 2020, but hey, God has put a stop to it, and I've had to reassess, and I've seen a door open, and I've seen a need, and I believe this church is mature enough. You say, we're only three years old, it's mature enough, and I'll prove to you shortly why we are. Okay, now you're in Acts chapter 1 and verse number 6, Acts chapter 1 and verse number 6, and I just want to show you, you know, when it comes to establishing a vision for our church and the things that we want to do, the ministries that we want to accomplish, it must be consistent with the Great Commission. Okay, and I, I remember when I first started this church, one of the first things I, I covered was the Great Commission. And I said, whatever decisions we make must be compatible with the Great Commission. You know, if someone comes up with an idea for the church, you know, it says, we should be doing this. My question to you would be, how does that line up with the Great Commission? Does it line up with the Great Commission? Yes, all right, this is something we can look at. If it doesn't, then don't bring it to my attention. Okay, because there's one job that Christ has left us to do, and that is the Great Commission. Acts chapter 1 and verse number 6, the Bible reads, when they therefore were come together, they asked of him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or the seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but ye shall receive power. After that the Holy Ghost is come upon you, 
and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. And so you say, what about that missions conference to Chile? Well, that's an outer part, you know, outermost part of the earth, right? When it comes to preaching the gospel, that's an area of the earth that needs to be reached. And when we talk about our local church here in, in Little Mountain on the Sunshine Coast, hey, you know, Chile, a mission trip there would be considered outermost part of the earth, would it not? But it's not just that. It says here, in Jerusalem, and we, I suppose we can say Jerusalem is, you know, the Sunshine Coast. And then it says Judea, we could say Judea is like Queensland, Okay. And then we'd say Samar Samaria, it's just another city. It could be Sydney. Okay? It could be some other place that we have an unto the uttermost part of the earth anywhere in the world. And brethren, you know what? We are a local church. You know, we are a church that's been established to reach this community. But at the same time, Jesus wants us to have a greater vision. He wants us to have a vision for the, you know, the wider areas. He wants us to have a vision for Australia, the other cities in Australia. And brethren, when we started Blessed Hope Baptist Church, it's because we had a vision for another city. Okay, yes, the need came. Yes, it wasn't expected. Hey, but it was, t it, it was compatible with the Great Commission. And brethren, I know, you know, you, you, might, you might be saying, you know, well, we're losing our resource here. We're losing our pastor here. But brethren, you're going to be rewarded by God. This church, you as a family, as a member of this church, will be rewarded by God because we saw the need for the work of God to be done in another city. And that's what Blessed Hope Baptist Church. You know, that's the influence we have. Yes, there are other good churches in Sydney. There are other good churches across Australia. You know, I don't care what you think. There are good churches. There are good pastors out there. There are people that are trying to serve the Lord with the gospel, okay? They might not be doing it exactly like we do it. They might not be doing it as often as we do it. But I know where their hearts are. And I know that they've been serving God for decades, many of these pastors. There are great people out there. Hey, but this church, don't underestimate what we've been able to accomplish. We've been able to establish, plant another church. You know how hard it is to just start a church? Just one church? And yet, and I'm, I'm not, this is not about me. This is about this church, this body. We're all part of this one body. We've been able to start this church and also establish, plant you know, Blessed Hope Baptist Church, okay? There's, there's a work to be done, done there. Now, please go to Acts 11. Go to Acts 11, verse 19. Acts 11 and verse number 19. So we saw that Christ wants us to reach all the places of this earth. He wants to use the resources of our local church to get out there and do a work in other places. Now, if you're someone that wants to get into the ministry one day, you have to be thinking about this, okay? You need to be thinking that God may want me to be relocated in another place, whether temporarily or permanently, and I need to be willing to do that for the Lord. You know, if I want to be in His work, if I want to be in His ministry, I need to be flexible enough, I need to put myself in a position and have the faith where I'll have to step out and do something where I'm going to be a little bit uncomfortable, where it might be a little bit challenging, all right? But this is so important that we are able to be flexible. And when I look at the families of this church, and I'm not, I'm, not, I'm not saying this to be critical to anybody, but when I look at it, it seems like at the moment that your pastor has the greatest flexibility. Right? That I, I have the f flexibility to get to different places and, and be a blessing to the brethren in different places right now. Okay? And if that's a resource that God has given this church, that I can be a pastor here and yet be flexible enough to reach and help other people, then, hey, we need to use that resource. We need, to, we need to be able to get there and just voluntarily allow God to open doors and be a blessing to other places in this world. All right? Otherwise, we get to Acts 11, okay? And if you know the story, you read, read through the book of Acts, God gave them the Great Commission, go everywhere! And they were so comfortable in Jerusalem. All right? They were comfortable with all their families and all their friends. They had their big church in Jerusalem. It was doing well, okay? It was growing and... But, you know, they weren't doing the Great Commission. They weren't going to these other places. And so we get to Acts 11, verse number 19. Look at this. Acts 11, verse number 19. It says, Now they which were scattered abroad upon the persecution that arose about Stephen traveled as far as Penance, uh, Phoenix, sorry, and Cyprus, Antioch, preaching the word to none but, only, but unto the Jews only. And some of them were men of Cyprus and Cyrene, which when they were come to Antioch, spake unto the Grecians, preaching the Lord Jesus. And the hand of the Lord was with them, and a great number believed, and turned unto the Lord. 
You see, brethren, if we don't voluntarily use the resources we have to reach other places, to be a blessing to believers in other places, then we may have to, like what God has to do here, allow persecution to come to force people to be scattered. And I don't want that. <laughs> you know, I don't want persecution before the time, especially if we do have the resource, we do have the flexibility, we do have men here who love the Lord, who love this body, who are able to cover me on Sundays to preach. You know, why not? Yes, let's use the resources. Let's establish a new vision. Let's say Blessed Hope Baptist Church needs a pastor full-time for 12 months to help that church, you know, reach another level, to reach another stage, for them to be a greater church, a greater light in, in the biggest city in Australia, to, to establish uh, more soul winners, to get the, the soul winning right and sound, and, and that they can win more souls for the Lord, and then come back here and give you a report of the great work that was, has been done. And I believe it'll be a great work. You know, I believe it'll be a great work. Let's, let's use that. Let's volunteer when we can. And let's not wait for the persecution to come to drive us out. All right? We have a great church here. It's only been three years. We're not a very big church, but it's a great church. It's a great church. All right? I mean, we have people that travel hours to be here. You know why? Because during that two-hour journey, they, there's no other good church like this. That's why. All right? So, you know, appreciate what you have. You say, are we really a great church? Just read the epistles, read Corinthians again, <laughs> read Galatians again, read the seven churches in, in Revelation again, and compare our church to that church. You tell me which church has grown and matured and is standing strong. Hey, a lot of those churches had major, major issues, all right? And, and the issues that we face in this church are but minor compared to the struggles that many of these other churches had in the Bible. We have a very mature church. Please go to, our, uh, go to Luke chapter 15. Go to Luke chapter 15. So is it consistent with the Great Commission, this new vision? Yes, it is. Absolutely it is. I would not be doing this. I would not be thinking about this if it was not consistent with the Great Commission that God has given us. All right? And I want you to understand this as well because <clears throat> I get emotional when I talk about this stuff. Right? <clears throat> You know, uh, you know, being a pastor, being a shepherd, uh, something about being a shepherd, you know, I, I don't really, I'm not really fond of animals, right? But when you have a pet, you, it kind of grows on you, right? I, you know, I remember when our neighbors, back in, in Sydney, our neighbor's cat would jump over the fence and the kids would play with us like, ah, oh, stupid cat, you know? And then it's like, well, Christina's like, well, let's feed it something. Because it was eating the birds, like it was, it was taking the birds, it was killing the birds, so let's feed it. So we started feeding it, and the kids started to hold her, and, and they grew fond of that cat, and then I started to hold the cat, and started to pat the cat, and I started to grow fond of the cat, right? And it's like, w when you become a shepherd, when you start to be a caretaker, you really start to grow in love uh, for that, right? And uh, I'm going to read to you from Jeremiah 50. You guys go to Luke, Luke 15, but I'm going to read to you from Jeremiah 50. Because is this vision consistent? with the heart of a pastor. You know, I, I would believe, it, I believe it is, all right? Jeremiah chapter 50, verse 6, you know, there were some bad pastors, there were some bad shepherds in the time of Old Testament Israel. And what God says about these shepherds, He says, My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have caused them to go astray. They have turned them away on the mountains. They have gone from mountain to, to hill. They have forgotten their resting place. All that found them have devoured them. Okay? So we have these shepherds, and of course that's what pastor means, right? It means shepherd. We have these shepherds of Old Testament Israel that did not care for the sheep. In fact, they drove their sheep away. Okay? And the sheep were scattered so much so that the enemy would come and devour, you know, the sheep. And brethren, you know what? I look at this church, and I see that this church is in a good place. I see that this church is in a resting place. I believe this church is being fed the Word of God every week, multiple times a week, you know, because of the, the great effort that not only I've put in, but a lot of you have put in as well to serve this local body. I see that these sheep are cared for, looked after, okay? But then when I look at Blessed Hope Baptist Church, yes, they're doing well, okay? But as their shepherd as well, I want them to have what we have. I want them to be able to uh, enjoy, uh, you know, the, the green pastures, and listen, we know the great shepherd, the good shepherd is the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? But I am a shepherd as well. I'm the under-shepherd. I'm a servant of the Lord Christ. And I have a heart of a shepherd. I want to make sure that the sheep have 
everything they need to grow and to enjoy the Word of God. You're in Luke 15, verse number 3. Let's compare that shepherd in Jeremiah, those that do not care for their sheep. And brethren, are there shepherds that do not care for the sheep? Man, I've seen them. They're out there. They don't care about the sheep being scattered. They don't care about the sheep. They only care about themselves. They care about the sheep when it benefits them. But you know, sometimes the, the shepherd has to be sacrificial, okay? Luke 15, verse number 3. It says, And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you, having an hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it? I never understood this passage. I was like, if I've got 99 sheep that I cared for, and I lose one, I was just, you know, we'll count that as a loss. Right? I mean, there's 99, you know. They're going to reproduce. They're gonna have, we're going to have more than 99 sheep eventually, right? Who cares about that one that got lost? Until I became a pastor, now I understand it. Now I understand it, okay? When I look at this church, I look at the 99 sheep that have, have been looked after. Let's just keep going. What's it say there? Verse number five, and when he had found it, he lay upon his shoulders rejoicing. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. And brethren, I'm not saying that the sheep at Blessed Baptist Church are lost. I'm not saying that, okay? But what I'm saying is that we've got 99 sheep here. Well, not, not literally, but you know, we have the 99 sheep here. And it says here, if you lose one of them doth not, sorry, verse number four, doth not leave the 99 in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. Say, so why is he in the wilderness? This is not like he's left him in a, in a, in a place to be attacked. What's, what he's talking about there is he's led this sheep out to like pastures where they can eat, where they can, you know, a shepherd would have to take his uh, sheep from time to time to different places because the place that they're at, you know, the food will be eaten. So you'd have to drive them into another place where they can eat the food there. And so he's got the 99 sheep They've gone into a wilderness, they've been fed, they've got a place to rest. And then he says, but I'm missing one. And I need to go and find that one, otherwise that one will go hungry. And what I believe with Blessed Up Baptist Church, it's a good church as well. It's, it's a great church, but I want to make sure I feed them well. Okay, I want to make sure they get the meat of the Word of God as well. Hey, the milk is important. Milk is important. Okay, milk of the Word of God is important. But eventually you need to get into the meat of the Word of God. And it's the meat of the Word of God will allow you to get stronger and grow. And my heart for that church is for them to get stronger, to grow, to be a great light for Sydney, you know. And listen, their success, you know, is because of this church. You know, I want to make sure that you can rejoice in their success when they do well, when they win souls. You know, whatever future, you know, plan God has for that church, when they do well, I want you to be able to say, hey, that's because New Life Baptist Church was willing to go and start that church, willing to give up their pastor for a time period, you know, so they can accomplish great things. I look at the 99 here and I say, man, we're doing well, okay? We're doing well. And yet I need to go and find that lost sheep. I need to get out there and make sure that sheep can also be, you know, have what the 99 have, you know? Never understood it. Until I, you know, I had two churches. <laughs> Never really understood that passage, but now, now I do. And if you can please go to Ephesians chapter 4. Go to Ephesians chapter 4. You say, is New Life Baptist Church ready you know, to be without their pastor for 12 months? Well, don't forget, I'm still coming here on Wednesdays. And I will be here some Sundays, all right? So obviously, in my heart, I don't believe we're completely ready to go without a pastor. Okay? But obviously, I'm not going to be able to be here full time like I am now. Is New Life Baptist Church ready? Well, when I thought about this question, obviously we want to build our, our understanding of what a mature church is on the Word of God. This church is going to be three years old. And when I look at a three-year-old child, are they ready to, <laughs> to, to you know, make a living for themselves and provide for themselves? Of course not. Okay, of course not. But that's not how God measures maturity. It's, you know, maturity is not measured by how old you are in the spiritual life or how old a church is. I know we measure that with our children, of course, that's, you know, because they grow at a, cons at a consistent rate. But when it comes to Christianity, when it comes to spiritual matters, we all grow at different rates. You know, some of us might take off and grow, you know, super quick, right? And then you kind of slow down. Some people, it's just a little bit at a time where they mature and grow. 
But look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11, speaking about the local church. It says, And he gave some uh, apostles <clears throat> and some prophets and some evangelists and some pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Now, before I keep reading, why? Okay, why do we have these teachers to come into a church and, and perfect the body? Look at verse number 13. What, what's the goal? What are we trying to achieve? Till we all come in the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God unto a perfect man, unto the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. That's the purpose for teachers and preachers, to help this body come into unity of the faith. Now, brethren, when I look at New Life Baptist Church, and I don't know, you, you think about this yourself. Do we have unity of the faith? Or are we fighting about doctrine? Are we arguing about the Trinity here? <laughs> are, are, are we debating whether the Lord's blood sacrifice is, is, is the atonement for our sins? Are we arguing these points? What, what, when we talk about the unity of the faith, what are we talking about here? Okay, obviously, when, normally when you start a church, I've, I've been greatly blessed. You know, by the work of online preachers, you know, where a lot of you have come into this church and you've already had great understanding, <laughs> you know, a, a great, uh, you know, knowledge of the Bible. And so there wasn't, you know, a, a great need or a great work to get us all established in the faith. Now, you know, I, I believe, you've, you know, you've been hearing me preach for almost three years. I believe you guys know what I believe. Or at least you've asked me if you had some questions of what I believe about certain things. I don't think you're going to get any further surprises from me. I, I don't think you, I'm just going to come out with some doctrine and you'll just be completely blown away. It's like, I never thought he believed that. I think you guys know exactly what I believe. And I think as a church, we know exactly where we stand. I believe we do have unity of faith because, listen, I mean, again, look at 1 Corinthians. Look how messed up that church is because of the, all the different doctrines and all the strange beliefs that are in that church. You know, that church was considered a babe in Christ. That church was considered, you know, a carnal church, not a mature church. We don't have that here at New Life Baptist Church. You know, when I think about the unity of faith, the first thing I think about are the fundamentals. You know, we're a fundamental Baptist church, aren't we? Okay, and what are the fundamentals of the faith? The in inerrancy of the Bible? Do we argue about that? We're not sure if the Bible's true and perfect and preserved and pure. We don't argue about that. We all believe that. We all believe it's true. Hey, the fundamentals is to believe in the literal account of the Bible stories. I've never heard anybody say to me, I think creation, you know, every day in that creation was like a million years and maybe God used evolution to get us here, right? The virgin birth, no one argues that Christ was born of a virgin. No one argues here about the Trinity. We're all on the same page. The bodily resurrection, did that really happen? Hey, these are fundamentals of the Christian faith. We're sound in this. The second coming of Christ, we all believe He's coming back. Not only do we all believe He's coming back, we're on the same page on the post-trib pre-raph rapture position. Okay? The Bible teaches. And I, I already mentioned the atonement of sins through Christ's sacrifice. You know, these are called the fundamentals of the faith. You know, this, this is a term that was used uh, in the early 1900s because a lot of churches were turning to a more uh, liberal view of the Bible. You know, maybe saying that these miracles aren't necessarily true. Maybe we can take things like evolution and, and apply that to the Bible and we can mix the wisdom of man, the philosophies of man and the Bible. No, you know what? We've got unity in that. We have unity in faith. And also when it comes to the statement of faith of this church, the things that are important for our church, you know, on the King James Bible, you know, as the, as the Bible to be used in this church because it's a perfect translation, we've got unity there. Salvation by grace through faith, not of works. You know, even repentance. You know, what is repentance for salvation? Repentance from unbelief. Repentance from not believing the gospel. That's the repentance. We're on the same page. You know, there are churches, independent fundamental Baptist churches, that do not have unity, even on repentance. Right. Okay, we have unity there. We don't argue about that. <laughs> Jesus, 100% God and 100% man at the same time. We believe in hell. Brother Callum just preached on hell just recently. We're not trying to avoid that topic. All right, we have unity in the dangers of hell. We're against abortion. I'm looking at the same of faith. And I've never heard anybody say, well, you know what? I think I'd like to abort my baby now because I've changed my mind on what the Bible teaches. No. Marriage between one man and one woman? Hey, we don't agree in homosexual marriage. 
the sodomite marriage, that trash, that's not even marriage. We have a biblical understanding of marriage. We agree what the Bible says there. I already mentioned creation, literal six days, post-tree, pre raph rapture, and we, we also believe in the literal millennium to come, Christ's thousand-year reign on this earth. These are things that are added, you know, to our statement of faith that we've got there. Do we argue about that? Do we ever sit down? Do we have, are you arguing that with anybody in this church? You know, we have unity in faith. We're a mature church. There are so many churches that don't have unity in some of these areas. We've got it. We've got it, right? We've, Ephesians 4, th- this church is what Ephesians 4 is, writing about, is being written about, right? To have unity in the faith. Let's keep going. Verse number 14. Why is it important to have unity? Verse number 14. That we henceforth be no more children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the slight of men and cunning craftiness whereby they lie in wait to deceive. Is this church being tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine? When someone comes into this church with some crazy idea, are we like, oh yeah, that must be true now. Listen, we've had weird people come into this church and they're not here. <laughs> you know why? Because they couldn't feed anybody their doctrine. They'd come with their weird doctrine. Now some of those people were saved, I'm sure. Some people have come with weird doctrine, right? And they realize, hey, I don't have an audience here. Why, why aren't they biting? Why aren't they accepting my wisdom? It's because we're, we're a mature church, that's why. We're not being tossed to and fro, okay? Is New Life Baptist Church ready? Do I expect, while I'm gone for 12 months, full time, do I expect all of a sudden you guys are going to believe in oneness? <laughs> Is that going to happen? Or are you going to just, you know what, maybe we do have to repent of our sins. Maybe we do have to keep the commandments of God to be saved. Is that going to happen? Do you think that's going to happen in this church? It's not going to happen, brethren. And you know what? You read your Bible, and people started to bring works into churches. It, it started to happen in those churches, you know? Churches that are documents for us in the Bible. We're a mature church. When, when you consider and you compare ourselves to the Word of God, look at verse number 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow up in, into him all things, which is the head of even Christ. You know, is there love for the brethren in this church? I believe absolutely there is. You know, can we improve? Yeah, I believe we can improve. I can believe we can have greater love for our brothers and sisters here in this church. How can we improve? Look at verse number 16. From whom the whole body fitly joined together and compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. Listen, the more you serve this church, the more you serve this local body, the more love you will have for the people in this church. Just like I talked to you about that cat. Ah, oh, that stupid cat, what's it doing in the backyard? Now I, I start to love that cat, right? You start serving the cat, you start looking after that little creature, you start to care. And listen, the more you serve in this church, you're going to realize that you start to grow a love for not just, like for each individual person in this church, you want everybody to be edified, to grow, whatever service that might be, brethren. You know, I'm not just talking about preaching behind the pulpit or song leading. You know, some of the ladies have, you know, been generous in, in providing things, in some of the food that's been brought, like whatever it is, cleaning. There's a lot of things, the toilets, just putting a toilet roll is serving the church, you know. And brethren, here's the thing, you know, on Sundays, when you're without your pastor for those 12 months, that means more of you are going to have to step up. That means more of you are going to serve this church because to make up, you know, for the lack of your past not being there, that means you're going to serve more. Guess what's going to happen? There's going to be more love. You're going to grow in love for one another the more you serve one another, the more you find areas that this needs to be. The you know, painting of the toilets, whatever. Man, just the little things, right? The covering up of that. I don't know, I can't remember who did that now. Was that Sam? I don't know. You know, just, you know, the internet. You know, the, the NBN, brother, brother Matt. You know, all the service you guys do, you're going to find, the more you serve this church, the more you're going to love this church, okay? The more it's going to grow in love. Do I believe New Life Baptist Church is ready? Absolutely. Please go to Hebrews chapter 5. Go to Hebrews chapter 5. Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 12. <coughs> Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 12. You know, yes, we are a young church. Yes, we're only going to be three years old. But again, how does Christ measure maturity? Okay, Hebrews chapter 5 and verse number 12, look at this. It says, for when, for the time ye ought to be teachers, ye have need that one teach you again, which be the first principles of the oracles of God. 
listen, when I'm not preaching and we have other men get up here and preach, we have several men that get up here and preach. And listen, I don't know about you, but I'm finding every time, as time goes on, they're getting better and better and better. Hey, we've got more and more teachers in this church. This is exactly what I wanted. I didn't want this church to be a one-man show. I never wanted that from the beginning. Okay? Are, are, are we a church that needs to be taught again the first principles of the oracles of God? Or are we a church that understands the basic principles, that understand the fundamentals, and we can build full from there? That we can, we can get into some deeper, meatier doctrine. Look at this. And are as become as, as, as have need of milk and not of strong meats. Can you say that this church needs to, we really need the milk. We need to get back to that milk. Or are we a church that we can say, hey, we can absorb some strong meat. Hey, we have some men that can even preach some strong meat. I believe that. I believe the latter. I believe this church absorbs strong meat very well. Look at verse number 13. For everyone that useth milk is unskillful in the word of righteousness, for he is a babe. Listen, I, again, don't measure me right now. Measure the other men that get up here. Are they preaching milk or some strong meat? You know, there's nothing wrong with milk. I preach milk from time to time. We need the milk. We need to be reminded of those things, right? We can't forget the foundational things. We need to cover those things from time to time so we don't get lazy on those things. Hey, but we don't spend all our time on the fundamentals. We spend our time on the meatier things, okay? They're being taught we have men that can teach meaty doctrine. Not only that, when I teach meaty things and I look at your faces, I can see that you can absorb it. You know, you're not a baby that's choking on meat, right? You're not a two-year-old, you know, or a one-year-old who needs mother's milk, you know, and you're just trying to force a piece of steak in their mouth. They can't chew because they don't have teeth. No, you guys have teeth. I realize when we preach some meaty things, you guys get it. You guys absorb it. You know, even the children absorb it. Are we a mature church? Or are we still a babe in Christ? Are we still little children? No, listen, not only are we mature, we have men that are growing that are becoming more confident in their preaching, more confident in the study, and they're able to teach the Word of God. Hey, these Hebrews did not have those men. We're a small church, and we have several men that I can count on to get behind the pulpit and preach a good sermon. Not just some fluff piece, but a decent sermon, man. You know, we, we have been blessed. New Life Baptist Church has definitely been blessed. Look at verse number 14. But strong meat belongeth to them that are of full age. Are we a mature church? Well, if you can absorb f- strong meat, guess what? We're full age. We're like an adult now. We're not a baby anymore. We can't expect New Life Baptist Church to still be in nappies, all right, and, and needs a bottle to be fed. No, we're a full age, the Bible says. Even those by who reason of use have their senses exercised to discern both good and evil. And listen, this church is a full age. You know, I don't know what your opinion is. My opinion is this church is a full age. Does that mean that, you know, we can never make mistakes? Does that mean we'll never have problems? Does that mean there are never things that we need to fix in this church? There'll always be that. There'll always be things that we need to improve. We're never going to be like Jesus Christ. We're striving to be more like Christ. We're never going to be there. We've always got the flesh. We've always got the weaknesses. We've always got our personal sins. We've all got our personal struggles. I understand that. But when I look at ourselves as a body, I see a mature adult. I see some, a body of full age. Not a baby in diapers needing a bottle to be fed. Okay, I believe this church is mature. I believe it is a full age. I do believe this church is ready to let go of their pastor full time. Let me be part time here. You know, let me serve that church full time down there in Sydney. And listen, the other reason I know that you're of full age is because when I spoke to you guys as families or one on one, ninety five percent support. Right, ninety five percent is like, yeah, this is a great idea. Go for it. I was shocked, brethren. I was surprised. I was expecting like a 60% pushback. <laughs> I was expecting like all of you guys like, oh, what are you doing? Are you crazy? Are you changing your mind on us? You know, you're letting us down. I, I didn't have that. I, c- I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that pretty much all of you were like, yeah, do it. You know, this is, this is good. We, we believe we can, we can uh, uh, you know, push forward. We believe in the men we have in this church. You know, that's what I've heard. I'm surprised. But I shouldn't be surprised because this church is a full age. And that just confirmed to me, for me the truth, that you guys are also on board with this revision. And brethren, listen, if you have concerns, that's fine. Uh, if you have concerns, please share them with me, okay? Because if you're making a, a new vision, if you're shifting tactics a little bit, 
Of course there should be concerns. Of course there'll be, you know, I, I can't fully understand the full impact this might have. Maybe you guys have a, a different pair of eyes and you can see that. And listen, just because there's concerns doesn't mean you stop the vision. It just means as you go and accomplish that vision, you need to make sure those concerns are covered. That there is an answer, there is a solution for those things, rather than just stopping things altogether. Okay? I do believe New Life Baptist Church is ready. And listen, uh, can you, I'll just read to you, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse number 6, speaking of the Thessalonian church. You know, Paul is writing to this church, and this is what he says about them. He says, And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction with joy of the Holy Ghost. Now look at verse number 7. So that ye were in samples to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. And brethren, New Life Baptist Church is an example. It's an example to other churches. You know, other people talk about our church. Other believers talk about our church in Australia, in, or maybe sometimes they might not talk favorably about this church. Some people don't, okay? But, you know, I get, a, I get feedback about our church. I get feedback about the preaching online, that it's blessing somebody. I, I've got feedback from other pastors that they're thankful for God for the work that's been done here on the Sunshine Coast. Listen, we have visitors that come through this church, don't we? And they go, they leave this church with a good report, you know? They're, they're in favor of the work that this church is doing. Look at verse number 8. For from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place. Your faith to God would spread abroad so that we need not to speak anything. Listen, the Thessalonian church was a mature church. You know, they were a good example to other believers across the world, other believers, other churches across the globe. And brethren, New Life Baptist Church is a good example. You know, I'm telling you, you know, the feedback I get. You know, my parents, I went to a funeral recently down in Sydney uh, for a family friend, and they came across somebody and they said, oh man, the preaching that's going from New Life Baptist Church, it's awesome. Praise God. Hey, that we've got a good report as a church, that we're considered a mature church, that we're considered an example to other believers in Australia. And so, you know, I'm just telling you that I believe this church is strong. And yeah, maybe leadership is part of that, but that's just part of it. All right? It's all of you. You know, the strength of a church is dependent on the strength of each family that represents the church. You know, we're only as strong as our weakest link. And brethren, we all have weak weaknesses in our families. We all have some struggles we go through. But listen, you're, do you're doing so much better than many other families in other churches. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, man. I've, I've been to church my whole life. This is the most mature church I've ever been at. <laughs> this is the most church of a full age that I've ever been at. It's a church where there's a unity in love and doctrine. Now again, I, I'm not saying that we've reached and we're just perfect now. We keep growing. We, we keep serving the Lord. We keep seeing what God wants to do uh, for us. And listen, I, I, uh, you know, in, in the men's leadership class, this might be a bit of a long sermon, sorry guys, but I need to cover this. You know, in the men's leadership class, I, I went through, and, and I went through the chess analogy. <laughs> Some of you guys might remember that. I asked Nicholas, can you get me a chess piece, the king piece, and I forgot to leave it, I left it on my bedside table. Anyway, pretend there's a chess piece right here, right? And, uh, you know, you might say to me, well, you're changing plans. Now, no one has really said this to me, right? You know, you, you're, you're giving up on us, or, you know, this isn't what you planned, why are you doing this now? You know, I look at life like chess, in many ways, right? I mean, chess is not a complicated game, for if you play chess, it's really not that complicated. I mean, the, the rule is this, you need to capture the opponent's king. That's number one. Number two, protect your king at all costs, all right? The, the king piece is the most important piece. It's not the most powerful piece, but it is the most important piece in the game of chess, all right? So you're trying to protect your king at all costs. And Brevin, look, I would not be doing this plan of going down to tw 12 months, you know, uh, to let this church fall apart. I would not be doing it if I felt this church was going to suffer in a great way. I would not be doing it, okay? Because when I look at my chess piece, my chess, pi oh, sorry, my king piece, my king piece is made up of a few things, and I do not want the enemy to capture it. I do not want it to be taken down, all right? And that, that king piece is my personal walk with God. I don't want that taken down. I want to keep a good fellowship with God. That king piece also represents my personal testimony. You know, I want to make sure that I'm blameless. I want to make sure that I've got a good report, not just within this church, 
but even other people, unbelievers, you know, that I deal with outside of this church, you know? And listen, if you're a single man or a single woman, these are two things that should be your king piece as well. I'm not going to allow anybody to take away my walk with God, my fellowship with God, or my personal testimony. These things are too important. I can't let the enemy capture those things, okay? But then you get married and you have a family, right? And then when you get married and you have a family, listen, that's my king piece as well. I don't want anybody to take down my family. I need to make sure that I look after my family. I do not want the devil to have my children. I do not want this world to influence my kids. I want my kids to love the Lord God. Okay? That's my king piece as well. And then we started this church, New Life Baptist Church. And listen, New Life Baptist Church is that king piece as well. I don't want anybody to take it down. It's not going to go down. And this is why I'm going to keep coming up on Wednesdays. All right? And make sure if anything comes up that I'm available and some Sundays. And if something is important, something is serious, I'm going to come up no matter what. Okay? I'm going to make sure it gets taken care of because I'm not going to allow this church to be taken down. Okay? But then we started Blessed Hope Baptist Church. And listen, that's my king piece as well. You know, as, as long as I'm the pastor over this, that church, I'm not going to let that church fail. All right? Now, one day, that church will have its own full-time pastor and it's no longer my king piece. Okay? But for now, it is. It is my, you know, and I cannot allow these things to fail. You know, I'm going to put all my effort, you know, everything, every resource, every ability that God has given me to defend that king piece. And brethren, I, I'm, I'm saying that because I want you to understand that I'm not just going there and I'm just not going to be thinking about New Life Baptist Church. I mean, constantly praying for you guys, constantly thinking about you guys, constantly trying to think, well, what is a great sermon that I can preach? I'm only preaching this church once a week now. I need to make sure that I give it the best I've got. You know, I give it a, a great quality, give them a great quality sermon so they can stay in the green pastures. And listen, the men that get up to preach, you're going to find that you're going to grow in love for the Lord. You're going to grow, grow in love for the Bible. You're going to grow in knowledge. You're going to, you know, be able to, maybe one day God can use you because of the experience that you've been able to gain by preaching more often that God may be able to use you at some point in the future for your own ministry. Who knows? You say, well, I have no desire. Well, you don't know that. <laughs> in 10 years' time, you may grow a desire. You know, I remember this missionary family, you know, they were just established here in Australia. I can't remember the, the names right now. They had kids, the kids got married, they grew up, they had grandkids, and then they retired. And then in their retirement, they're like, you know what? We need to serve God, <laughs> right? In their retirement, they grew a desire for the Lord and they ended up being missionaries to some place. You know, what's, you know they're old. <laughs> you know, they've gotten past their, you know, you, you know, as Australians, you think, man, now you relax and take it easy. They said, no, now the desire's grown. We've gotten that part through that part of, in our lives, you know, and now we're going to get out there and serve God and win many souls. Uh, you know, you, you never know how a desire for serving God may come, you know. And so, you know, just for those that are going to be stepping up to preach, please, you know, understand, you know, take, take advantage, take the opportunity because you will grow in knowledge. You know, the Holy Spirit will be working in you so you can uh, have great sermons for this church. Because you know what? I don't want New Life Baptist Church to fall and neither does God. Neither does God. That means He's going to empower the rest of you guys to serve this body in a great way. You know, the power is going to come from the Lord God. Now, please go to, uh, go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4. The next question might be, is this biblical? You know, yes, you know, it's consistent with the Great Commission. It's consistent with the pastor's heart, a pastor's heart, right, who cares for the sheep. Yes, this church is mature enough for the leadership to move on temporarily. Okay, yes, it is. But is it biblical? Now, there are two, there are, uh, well, there are three books in the Bible that are considered pastoral epistles, okay? And they're written to two pastors. Who are they? Timothy and Titus. So you've got 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy, and Titus. These are pastoral epistles. Now, this means that Timothy and Titus must have had a family, okay? If being ordained as an elder or a deacon, sorry, or as a bishop, right, as a pastor, you had to have one wife, you had to have faithful children. These men had families too. And listen, to serve God with a family, it's harder because there's a lot more that you need, to, a lot more logistics that you need to consider when you've got a large family, right? You're in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 17. Have, have a look at this. So, of course, Paul is writing to the church in uh, Corinthians, and then he says this, For this cause 
have I sent unto you Timotheus. Now, Timotheus is Timothy, who is my beloved son and faithful in the Lord, who shall bring you into remembrance of my ways, which be in Christ, as I teach everywhere in every church. Now, notice that about Timothy, okay? He's definitely a man who's married with kids. He's going with, with Paul on his missionary journeys. And yet, when the Corinthian church has a need, when, they're, when, when, when you know, there's a lack of leadership there, what does, who does he send? He, send? he sends Timothy. He sends Timothy, right? Listen, Timothy had to be someone that was willing and able to go and help another church. He was being sent to do that work. I'm going to read to you from 1 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1, and this is a more mature church. The Thessalonian church was a mature church. It says, Wherefore, when we could no longer forbear, we thought it good to be left at Athens alone, and sent Timotheus, our brother, and minister of God. By the way, that minister of God means he held an office there. Okay, this is, I know we're all ministers, we're all servants of God, but when you see that term minister of God, that's referring to the fact that Timothy has an office. It says, And our fellow laborer in the gospel of Christ to establish you and to comfort you concerning your faith. And so we know the Corinthian church was messed up, but we have the Thessalonian church, and they're a lot more mature. They're able to absorb some strong meat. All right? I mean, they get a lot of teaching about the second coming of Christ, things like that. And even then, Paul sends Timothy to that church. Why? To establish that church. And brethren, that's my goal for Blessed About This Church, to go and establish them further, to make them more grounded, more faithful, you know, stronger in the Word of God, stronger in their love for the Lord. So Timothy has been sent to the Corinthian church. He's been sent to the church in Thessalonica. And as I was studying this, I was like, man, Timothy, you, you got sent everywhere, right? You go to uh, Philippians chapter 2. You go to Philippians chapter 2 for me. Philippians chapter 2. And while you're turning to Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to read to you from 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2. You go to Philippians chapter 2. I'm going to read to you from 1 Timothy chapter 1 verse 2. It says, Unto Timothy, my own son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord, as I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus. When I went into Macedonia, thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine. And so we see that, that Paul left Timothy here in Ephesus, in the church of the Ephesians, to be their pastor, to get them right, right on doctrine. And so, man, Timothy, where are you being sent to? Corinth, Thessalonica, Ephesus, you're in Philippians chapter 2, verse number 19. It says, but I trust in the Lord Jesus to send Timotheus shortly unto you, that I, may, that I also may be of good comfort when I know your state. So who, where else did he go? He went to Philippi. Did Timothy serve in multiple churches? Was he overseen? Was he pastoring multiple churches? Yes. Was he being sent? Yes. And listen, brethren, he didn't have Jetstar. He didn't have a car. Okay, it's not like he could go every week back and forth. When he went to serve a church, he was there gone for months and years to help that church. Is it biblical? It is biblical. It is biblical. Now look, ideal, ideally, we have a pastor full-time here, full-time there, completely independent of itself, right? Ideally, that's where we want to be. And that's why they went to establish these churches. Eventually, they were to teach, instruct, get men trained up, so one day one of those men, faithful men, can step up and be a pastor. Hey, that's my goal. That's my goal. But notice the thing about Timothy, he was willing and he was able. You know, he was in a position that he could be sent. Now, I don't, we don't have the details exactly how he was sent. I'm sure he was being supported by some churches. Maybe he had a side business like Paul, like a tent maker on the side to make that happen. But listen, do you think that was easy for Timothy to go back and forth with his family? He's a pastor. He had a wife and kids. All right, we don't know how many, but he would have, been, had, would have had at least a couple of faithful children. Listen, but he was willing to sacrifice. He was willing to be used by the Lord to go and help churches in all places across the place, you know, of where they were, you know. Gentile churches and things the like. Listen, this is biblical. You know, I, I wouldn't be doing something if I did not have a reason to do this. You know, I was challenged by a pastor, a friend of mine, you know, is your decision based on the Word of God? Absolutely. <laughs> I mean, if you just read the book of Acts, just read through the epistles, you'll see this happens time and time and time again. Titus is another man that was being used greatly by Paul to be sent to different places and ordain elders in every city. 
Listen, it is biblical, you know. So, I know, ideally, we want the pastor here full-time all the time. But listen, if I had a Timothy, and I'm not talking about Timothy Foley here, okay? But if, I had a, if I had a Timothy, a man who's a pastor, who's ready to go, who's ready to be sent, I'll send him. I'll send him, okay? But we don't have another Timothy right now. I'm the guy, you know, I'm the guy that is flexible. I'm the one that's able. I'm the one that's willing to sacrifice. You know, I don't really desire to pick up my family and, and, and go for 12 months and pick them up again. I mean, my wife and I, we're talking about all the logistics. Man, it's a headache. You know, what are we going to do? We're going to just sleep on sleeping bags on the floor. If that's all we have to do, that's what we have to do. I'm going to try to take as little as we can over there, keep our things here so we can, you know, come back here and, you know, not make it so difficult on the way back. Amen. Listen, but we do it for the Lord. We do it for the churches, you know. And this isn't just my ministry I want this church to be on board. I want all of you to say, hey, this is our ministry. And listen, brethren, just like Timothy would go and bring back a report to Paul, you know, a good report or a bad report, I'll be doing the same thing for you guys. I'll be coming back on Wednesdays and some Sundays and I'll be giving you a report. I'll be telling you, this is the work that's happening. This is what we're doing. These are the souls that are getting saved. These are the men that are being trained up. I'll be giving you a report so you know what to pray for, that you feel involved in the work, this revision that is going ahead. Brethren, it's as biblical as anything, you know, what, we're, what, what, what I'm trying to, to accomplish. Are you still in Philippians? Philippians chapter 2. Look at verse number 20. Why was Timothy being sent to the Philippian church? Look at verse number 20. For I have no man like-minded who will naturally care for your state. For all seek their own, not the things which are Jesus Christ's. You say, oh, Pastor, Pastor Kevin, you just want to go back to Sydney because your family, your friends are there. You're seeking your own. No, I'm not. This is my own here. New Life Baptist, you guys are my family and my friends. <clears throat> but he says, look, I have no man like-minded. <clears throat> Who will naturally care for your state. Listen, it's a natural thing for me to care for the state of Bethesda Baptist Church, all right? It's a natural thing for me to care for this church as well. And listen, if you want to be a pastor one day, you have to get that natural care for you for other people and other churches, other places in this world, and say, Lord, I'm willing. If, if, if you want me to take on this office, I'm willing to be sent to a place where I can naturally care for the state of other people. You know, because look, look at verse number 21, for all seek their own. Listen, Paul had other people. He had other churches. He knew a lot of people. He says, the only one that I can send is Timothy because he's like-minded, because he cares for you. Everyone else is just seeking their own. They're not seeking the things of Jesus Christ. And listen, I'm not saying that if you're unable to move that you're seeking your own pleasures. You know, this isn't a job for everybody. I get that, you know. It's, it's, you know being a pastor is not just this check the boxes, I've met the qualifications, now I can be a pastor. You know, there's more to it. You know, you've got to be willing to sacrifice you know, your time, you know, your finances even. You've got to be willing to give certain things up because you care about other believers, all right? Now, if you can go to the book of Habakkuk, I'm almost done now, we're at the conclusion. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse number 1. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse number 1. Ah, sorry when I get emotional, guys. Uh, I want you to know that I care for this church. It's not easy. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse number 1. Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse number 1. Now the title for this sermon was 2020 Revision. Okay? Now, I haven't worked it all out. I know what I want to do. <laughs> I know what it's got to look like a little bit. I'm still trying to work it out. I'm still trying to document all of it. I'll put it on a PowerPoint and I'll share it with every family here eventually. Hopefully I'll get it done in a week or so. But I want you to notice Habakkuk chapter 2 and verse number 1. It says here, Habakkuk speaking, he says, I will stand upon my watch and set me upon the tower and will watch to see what he will say unto me and what I shall answer when I am reproved. Listen, I don't have all the details figured out just yet. I'm trying to put it all together, all right? Please be patient. It takes time. Uh, for a big move like this, right? And I'm waiting on the Lord. You know, I'm, I'm waiting for the Lord to give me an answer. What is the Lord going to say to me? I really know what He wants. He's really spoken to me in the Word of God. And I see that these plans are biblical. These are His words 
And if these are His words and I'm walking in accordance to His will, it's going to be successful. It's going to work. It's going to be what the Lord wants, right? But I'm still waiting for some of those details to come through. Look at verse number two. And the Lord answered me and said, Write the vision and make it plain upon tables that He may run that read of it. And brethren, that's my next goal right now. I want to document this vision. The next 12 months, or next 15 months, okay, because it's still three months away, October. I need to document, I need to write down, I need to make this plain to all of you so you can read it and you can understand it, okay? Verse number three, for the vision is yet for an appointed time, but at the end it shall speak and not lie. Though it tarry, wait for it. How do we start? That our soul ought to wait upon the Lord. Brethren, this vision, I don't have it all, I don't have it all figured out yet. Okay, just because I don't have it figured out, does that mean it's not God's will? Now, sometimes God just wants us to tarry a little bit. He wants us to wait, right? He wants us to be able to slowly put it all together. It says here, because it will surely come, it will not tarry. It will surely come. This vision will take place. Come October, my family will be going to Sydney. I want you to understand that, okay? But I want to make sure that this vision is clear to this church and the vision is clear to Blessed Hope Baptist Church. But look at verse number four. And I, I want your hearts to be right, and I know it is, because I speak to most, all of you pr- pretty much just are like, let's do this. You know, I'm, I'm really encouraged by your support to me. It says here, Behold, his soul which is lifted up is not upright in him, but the just shall live by his faith. And we know that term, very famous, the just shall live by his faith, or the just shall live by faith. Listen, when you have a big vision, when you have a vision, you're waiting for the the Lord's instruction, you're waiting for the details to come together, there's always going to be a bit of pushback. Like I said, there's always going to be some concerns, all right? And it's healthy, it's good, it's right for there to be concerns. Let's address those concerns. Let's address those concerns together, all right? But don't be the soul that is lifted up in you. Don't be the one that says, oh, I know why he's going. He doesn't care for this church and he has his own personal ambitions to do this. Don't be that soul. That's the one that's lifted up. That's the one that's filled with pride. Instead of caring for the vision, instead of caring for other believers, it's, oh, this is going to affect me. And this is just, oh, it's not good for me. Listen, have a, a vision is to have a long-term view, to have a big picture view, to understand that God's kingdom is more than just what we're doing here. Okay? The Great Commission is more than what we're just doing locally. It's to reach other places in this world. Instead of being the one that's lifted up with pride, be the one that says, but the just shall live by his faith. You know what? This church, we have to step out in faith. I have to step out in faith. Not everything is going to be written down necessarily and fully understood. There are times you just have to step out in faith and say, God, I don't have all the answers. I don't know exactly how it's all going to come together, Lord, but I know you have a vision for this church. I know you have a vision for Blessed Baptist Church. I know you have a desire for me as a pastor. And I, many times I'm just going to have to step out in faith and say, and, and I need you guys to step out in faith. You know, this is the greatest advantage. We've seen the shield of faith in the armor of God series, how important it is, you know, the shield of faith. We have faith, brethren. We have an advantage over the unbelieving world. You know, they need everything detailed and understood and they're looking at themselves selfishly. What do I get out of this situation? No, we're people of faith. Listen, our home is heaven. You know, we're trying to bring as many people into those gates of heaven as, as much as possible. And brethren, if this church is willing to let me go for 12 months of my family down there, I promise you this, there's going to be more souls saved down in Sydney. And it's going to be on the account of this church that we're willing to give sacrificially to Blessed Hope Baptist Church. And listen, just like Habakkuk, I'm going to write down the vision. I'm going to make it clear. You're going to be able to read it. You're going to be able to understand it. You know, I want to make sure that we are all on the same page. So, brethren, 2020 revision. Do we need to revise things from time to time? Yes. Was that my plan going into 2020? No. The pandemic changed it completely. And listen, doors have been opened, a need has been acknowledged and and understood. And brethren, all I'm trying to do is serve the Lord Jesus Christ to the most of my ability. I never thought I'd be pastoring two churches, but this is the situation I'm in. And maybe I needed to learn that. I needed to learn what, it's, what is it like to really be a pastor, one that we can see in the Word of God, a man who's willing to be sacrificial, a man who's willing to go and serve other churches. 
listen, brethren, that's what I want to do. But at the same time, I don't want to neglect this church. I want you to know that. I love you guys. We're praying for you guys every day. You know, I'll be coming here every week. You know, you're my king piece. You know, if this church fails, I fail. My ministry fails. My reputation fails. You know, I, I can't afford that. But hey, we need to step out in faith, don't we? We need to trust the Lord. He is our help. He is our shield. He is our defense. Let's pray.